Hi, I'm Mitch and welcome to the Restoration Road where my guest today to lead us in our series on restoration theology include Curtis Smith, Director of Outreach of Parkview. Thank you so much for being here, Curtis. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Do Great to be here. Do you still pay attention to the weather every day? Uh, yes, not, not to the level of detail I used to. People still ask me about it. I bet they do. Uh, but no, I, I don't always have a great answer anymore. David P. Dean, the clean comedian, <laughs> uh, are you doing the weather still? I had a wonderful stay here at the Cruise Museum last <laughs> night. I slept like a baby over here in that Model T, <laughs> only to find out this morning, unbeknownst to me, this is not, in fact, a bed and breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm going to see you later probably with a helmet and a racing suit on. I'll be sleeping. <laughs> Eight o'clock, I'll be in one of these race cars sleeping again tonight. Uh, Brenda Gerber, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Mitch, for inviting me. Today we want to talk about salvation. We're in our series on restoration theology. We're taking the 10 systems of theology, and that's uh, a little acrostic that I developed, a GMC Triple S mm. Cab E. Mm. <laughs> and is, He's going to test you. Here we go. <laughs> How about you guys try it collectively? Here we go, viewers. <laughs> We're going to try it collectively, okay? GMC Triple S Cab E. The G is? God. God. Man, Christ. Christ. Oh, good job. Triple S? Sin salvation is the is the second and third. That's right. Yes. The first uh, one is the salvation? First, uh, spirit. No. Spirit. 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 Sin salvation. Sin salvation. Sin salvation. And then cab, church, church. <laughs> angels, angels, Bible, Bible, Bible and end times. End times. The ends at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we have in the worksheet uh, lots of the details of salvation and the theology <laughs> about it. But what I think would be most powerful today is if we could share individual stories of coming to Christ. Um, Brenda, would yeah, you mind absolutely. leading us off? Yes, um, absolutely. I came to Christ in college. I um, I was raised in a family um, of believers, but uh, never was really um, taught to have a relationship uh, with God, with Christ, with what that looked like. We were raised in a family that we we did good things, and I um, am thankful for that foundation. It wasn't the foundation that I that I was you know I seek now, but it was a wonderful start. Um, to how we were raised. It wasn't until I got to college did people start, um, specifically one person in my sorority. Um, we were at the union. I remember which booth we were sitting in. And she started challenging me, me in ways that I, I couldn't answer the questions. And I had been raised in the church and really couldn't answer some of the questions that she had. And it started a, it started a conversation. And it started me seeking more information about, you know, what did that really look like and, and how did that really play out in my life and really what was my relationship, you know, with God. And it was through her and through her guidance and through her, just her patience um, and really helping me to understand that there was a different way. And, and that's when I came to Christ. And, um, and it was just a growth from there. It was, it started, you know, as a, as we talk about, like a seed, and it has grown um, my faith over the years. And it's, it's, it's looked differently at different stages in my life, but that's um, how I came to know Christ. Hmm. Curtis, how about you? I first prayed to accept Jesus into my life as a six-year-old in my first grade Sunday school class that was taught by my grandmother. Uh, and it was the first time I remember having some concept of what Jesus had done for me. But I would say that I kind of went through elementary, middle, and high school uh, loosely walking. And then when I got to college as a freshman, I got plugged into Campus Crusade for Christ and kind of really recommitted my life there and kind of um, intellectually was able to catch up with what I think my six-year-old mind and body was thinking and feeling. Uh, and so it became much more real there in my freshman year of college, and I started walking with God actively then. Awesome. I know you're at Nub's Knob, and I know David Ron was there, but I don't know how you got there. And Real similar to his story. Uh, kid, young kid, and then it, it was kind of a drift for a while. It's one of those uh, kind of a group. You're in Sunday school. We, were, we, we always called ourselves the CEOs of church, Christmas, Easter, or other. That's the only time we went, and um, uh, so my, my sister 
she made a profession of faith. She was the youngest and the next. And then my parents, my parents like were in their mid thirties. So I think kind of a rebellious teen, I kind of avoided the church and anything my parents and family were doing, I was gonna do the complete opposite, you know? Uh, and so um, I think the, the veil was lifted, my eyes were open, I had an epiphany on a Youth for Christ retreat where I saw people laughing and they loved God and I'm like, wow, that's the coolest marriage ever. I'd like to be a part of that. So I always tell people, you know, Dave Ron, who's now the vice president of Youth for Christ USA, he was the one that presented the gospel that night. And I always tell people to this day, I was a junior in high school, that I don't really, maybe you two were different, but I don't, I don't, I didn't fully comprehend everything that I was doing that night, but I did know this, whatever Dave had in his heart and in his life, I wanted that too. Mm. So that's kind of how I made the, the decision to step forward. I was nine years old and we had moved around the corner in the country, but now it was the, in a way that I could walk to our church. So it's summer and uh, it's a half mile walk and it's kind of two big hills. And so I walked down there and back then the church was always unlocked and that day there was nobody there. And so I walked to the uh, altar and just God and me and I, just thought I'd ask him, you know, what do you want me to do with my life? And I had kind of a, a holy moment there. Um, but at junior church, uh, they talked about a girl my age in my, my Sunday school class getting saved. And I thought, what did I miss up until this point? I've come here three times a week. I've done all the crafts. <laughs> <laughs> I filled out all the papers. <laughs> what does it mean to be saved? What are they talking about? And so I started listening to things a little bit differently. And uh, Tom McCowan gave uh, a, a sermon that I learned in seminary <laughs> decades later that if you really want people to get a parable, um, what it meant 2,000 years ago, you got to retell it in a way that mm -hmm. they would get it today. And he did that. Um, he told this great story, the parable of the prodigal son, and he had, it was in Fort Wayne, and it, it was amazing. Mm. It was just amazing. Brought it all to life. Well, that week, I had been in my dad's office supply closet uh, at their office. And as a kid, I didn't have a lot of toys, but I really liked office supplies. <laughs> I thought that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a nerd as a child. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was purposely laying back so you could take that one. <laughs> no filter, I'll jump on it. <laughs> Let me say what everybody's thinking. <laughs> so, did that, you see Mitch's parents like a stocking stuff or is like a stapler? <laughs> Here you go, Mitch. Uh, I guess this is what you want to play with. <laughs> oh. A new ballpoint pen set. No. <laughs> Check out this eraser. Box of envelopes, thanks. <laughs> it's true. Dad, a book of stamps, you're the best. <laughs> Come on, three hole punch. Come on, three hole punch. <laughs> we could do this for days. <laughs> Anything but a stapler. <laughs> Sidebar, hit the pause button. I forgot where I was anyway. Um, I'm in Waterloo and we're at an auction and I'm a kid helping at the auction about around the same time. And my uncle gets something out of, uh, I think it was my parents' vehicle, my dad's car. And I shut the door and it's locked and my fingers in it. Oh, oh no. Mm -mm -mm. And I'm screaming. And I can picture him running. He was a big guy. And I picture him running so fast back to me oh. and locks it comes out. It was my fingernail, nothing broken, anything like that. But to cap it all off, after I lost my fingernail, I stapled something right in it. Oh, uh, can you believe that? Uh, Playing with a stapler from my office supply. I thought it was a way to make you feel better. We're going to take you to Home Depot. <laughs> so from that so point on. So the stapler on, is the one office supply yes, that's I have off the office. staplers. I would not allow staplers in my office as an adult. It's all I don't paper have them anywhere oh, near me in oh, my that's house. Awful. I've outlawed them completely. Wow. Awful. Yep, yep. So I'm in my dad's <laughs> office supply closet. Looking at a green metal box, and it's shiny. And I think that would be so good 
for my rock collection. Yes. And um, I didn't have a rock collection, but I had <laughs> kids with shiny polished rocks and I thought I would want some of those. So I took the green metal box. Well, I hear the peril of the prodigal son. And so I kind of go up with my uh, question to Tom and who gave that message. And I said, what if you did something that you're not sure it was wrong at the time? but now you think it is. Uh, what's God think about that? And I got a little quiver in my voice and he gave me, uh, I can't remember exactly the words, but it was like a very, a God of grace. It was really interesting. So I, I, uh, I go home and I, at Sunday lunch, I tell my mom and dad about the green metal box. My mom brought the wrath of God down on me. She said, how could you ever think think of taking anything that wasn't yours. But standing in the other corner is my dad, a consummate politician and salesman, P.T. Barnum, <laughs> in the flesh. And he said, what? He said, if you see a piece of gum on anybody's desk, just have it. <laughs> it's my office. In fact, like, I own the office and everything in it. <laughs> you know, just take it. I go to my room and I'm liking my dad's theology a lot yeah. better than my mom. Yeah. <laughs> but it led me to understanding that there is something I need to be saved from. And uh, it, 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 I started to understand sin for the first time. So I was uh, probably fourth grade, about nine years old, started my life to Christ, got baptized. But uh, I learned over time the best way to avoid heart transformation is keep Jesus in your back pocket as life insurance, but yeah. maintain control of your own life. And after about a, about a decade in the marketplace, I needed a long overdue appointment with God. Isn't it amazing to hear the four stories that the, the influence of a parent or a grandparent or somebody in your life that spoke truth in your life? That was always our prayer for our kids growing up. You know, we'll, we'll preach the gospel, live the gospel, love the gospel. But if we have godly friends who want to speak truth into the lives of our kids, we prayed for that as well. Yeah. And sometimes the voice of a another person was right. as effective, if not more so, than your own voice. I have four girls. I led my oldest to Christ. Uh, she's about four or five. Get, she could get it. I walk in one night for Kelsey, my second oldest, and I'm starting to kind of get into that conversation. And she said, Daddy, you're going to ask me to surrender my life to Christ as Savior and Lord? I said, yeah. <laughs> Megan already did. Oh. I, I prayed that already. <laughs> Megan, <laughs> get in here right now, That's Megan. Right. That's right. So she, this is really amazing. She led her. Kelsey led Lily huh. and Lily Haley. Wow. And you wow. just can't make that up. Yeah. Wow. It, it, it's just happened that way. And I actually led my husband to Christ. Oh, my goodness. And that was such a powerful experience for me. Wow. And my faith has been so renewed through him because he just sees faith in such a child. Right. Just through a child's eyes. And, and I had people who counseled me who said, you know, you know as, as, a, as a believer, you know, that we wanted to surround ourselves with believers and marry a believer. And God brought this amazing man into my life. Wow. And he and he understood, but he didn't have that relationship. And God just used me in such a powerful way in his life. And I think the thing that I enjoyed the most is when we were going through this kind of process, we would be in the car and, and he wanted to know about the parables. Tell me about, you know, tell me these stories. And and it was just it's it's re, it was a renewal for me. And it was just amazing to watch him walk through this journey. And and now he is the person in our house that that prays before meals, and his children watch that. Mm. And and it's just been such a journey, um, you know. That's incredible. It, it has been. Wow. It's, it's been really amazing. Wow. You have adult children. How have they followed yeah. suit when they see that? You know what? I and I think, you know, we all go through. I think we go through phases. I mean, they were raised and they were raised by me. Um, they were raised in a Christian home from the time they were born. They, you know, we, we, um, studied the Bible and we, and we went to church and we prayed, um, before meals and before bed. And it was an open conversation. 
And I, and I think that for each of them, their journey has been different. And I think that for them, there's that seeking of, of truth for themselves. Right. And, and I continuously pray. And I can remember when they were little, and this just happened, but I would go into their rooms and they, they have these memories of, of maybe waking up a little bit and here's mom, like, what is she doing in my room? But I would go in after they had fallen asleep and I would pray over them. Oh my. And I, um, matter of fact, my son was just home for Thanksgiving. And he had gone to bed, and I woke up, and and um, my husband said, "Where are you going?" And I said, "I'm going to go pray over my son. He's 25 in his room." And he said, "You are going to freak him out. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you cannot." That's awesome. So I didn't. Um, I, I, I I didn't go. But I just, you know, for me, I have prayed for my children for wow. um, for their futures, for for their professions, for their relationships, for their children. And so I just, I have, and, and that's where the trust comes in when we talked about the sin at first. It's where the trust comes in that, that, that God's got this. Yeah. And that I have, I have, um, you know, He's entrusted me with raising these two amazing children, now four, and that I have to just continue to trust God's plan. That as they continue to journey and question and, um, and kind of figure things out for themselves, that, uh, that God has got them in their hands. Yeah, I think our kids go through uh, maybe three or four stages. I think they borrow our faith. If, if we're believers and we have children, they'll borrow our faith. And I think they might rent it. And then maybe they'll lease it. They'll actually sign like a 36-month lease. And then finally, you know, they need to uh, purchase it, own it for themselves. They finally own it for themselves. So it's, it's a journey. How, how about with your kids? How, how has that unfolded? Yeah, I think we're in that rent to lease kind of phase. Um, they grew up in a Christian home, obviously, and they went to Christian school. Yeah, and being in church all the time, I feel, I feel like at times we maybe even were hitting them over the head with it. Um, but it was always our faith that they were definitely borrowing. And now, as my oldest is 21, and we have a 19 and 15, they're they're moving towards that phase of owning. But you're, as a parent, you're a little nervous. You you'd like them to go ahead and sign the contract and put yes. some money down and yes. actually buy it, exactly. <laughs> you know? That's it. <laughs> because they're getting into uh, certainly the the two oldest ones, but even our youngest is in high school. They're getting into that that stage of life where they're seeing the real world and they're encountering a lot of things that are outside of our control. And so, yeah, you just keep praying for them diligently that it's going to be their own faith, that they do own it, that it's not just remembering being in church, that it's an actual relationship with Jesus for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a nerve wracking time as a parent to get from that borrowed to own stage. Yeah. It's a nerve-wracking chunk of time in there. It is. Uh, to me, one of the hardest things is when you drop them off at college. Um, I was I was devastated when we dropped our oldest one off. I mean, I went in mm -hmm. the tank probably for weeks. <laughs> yeah. And then the second oldest went a little bit closer, and I thought I was going to do okay. I'm excited. I might see her again soon. She's going to start the volleyball season. I'll be down there. I'll watch that. And uh, all of a sudden, when it's time to leave, my oldest breaks down in her arm. I'm, I'm sorry, my youngest breaks down in her arms. Yeah, oh boy. And so that's number four, breaking down the arms, and number two, <laughs> going to college. So we get in. Uh, we're in two separate vehicles to take everything there. We get in the car, and the third, number three, gets in with me. And the doors go boom, boom. And I go, well, that settles that. She goes, what? I go, you're going to IPF. <laughs> <laughs> you're staying you close. Staying home. And now she's going the farthest of anybody. It's going to break my heart. <laughs> and that's where the trust comes in. It yeah. sure does. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It gets kind of scary. They got to start owning then when you, I, I don't know. You know, I grew up in a family auction business. And so you think you're going to be around everybody all the time. There's not this departure. And, man, I'm telling you, that. It's serious because when you drive away, they are now on their own to make their own yeah. choices. Sure. Yeah. And that's and, hard. And they all take such different paths that it's hard to... Our oldest uh, chose to go to Huntington. Very close. 45-minute drive. We were completely plugged in. Our middle son is in school in Los Angeles. And it is a vastly different experience for us. And it is... Uh, I feel like it's a lot more prayer. 
and trust and faith. Yeah. Uh, sending him 2,000 miles away and uh, not really knowing the environment that he's in every day. And mm. it's, uh, that's the other thing. It's just, it's not like I can't even lump them all together as kids. This is what it's like for the kids because there's, it's such an individual so thing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, their path is so yeah. different that it, uh, boy, it just plays out so wildly different. Hmm. David, you have a son and daughter? Growing up, uh, the kids came with me on the road quite a bit. So we either picked up an extra flight or we put them in the back of the car. But uh, they loved to pack up a little book bag and books and toys and homework. And uh, So I either spoke at a conference, a youth conference, a camp or whatever, or did comedy. So they traveled you know, with me quite a bit. So... I didn't think about it at the time consciously, but looking back now in hindsight, it's kind of funny to look at dad's work through the lens of a child, you know. You, you can't just live it in front of the people or on stage. You have to live it genuinely, live it in every facet of life. And so I, I, I just recall, I, I was haunted by uh, a book I'd read on uh, Billy Graham where Ruth, and was not condemning but just said that she raised the kids billy saved the world but the kids just didn't know dad so that crazy dichotomy of saving the world but the kids didn't have time with the man who pointed everybody to jesus i just that haunted me so i knew i was going to be gone and travel a lot so i made it a point to take one of the kids or betsy with me as as i traveled so Alex is 2060 police down in Clearwater, Florida. And uh, we call her Hannah Banana from Indiana. She works with special needs, uh, young adults in Nashville, Tennessee. So, um, yeah, we miss them, but um, uh, thankful for their, you know, their life and the way they, we, just, we taught the kids early just to serve. And I, I remember someone had told me that your happiest adults are kids that learn to serve when they're young. And so, we were introduced to, to mission trips in the Dominican Republic when they were uh, probably a sixth grade and then a ninth grader. And that just changed their whole paradigm. Their whole world was turned upside down once they were exposed to third world missions. So anybody watching, you have young children, there's, there's never yeah. an age limit that's too young to expose a child to yeah. life on the other side of the world. That's right. And children watch us serving. Yes. I mean, that's just such a, it's such a, it has been a strong theme of, you know, just, just watching people serve and, and learning from that and having, and you don't think your kids are watching and they, they watch everything. No, you're, you're right. And a couple of years ago at Christmas, we had a family gathering, like nostalgic, what was your best memory as a child? And they're both without missing a beat. It was like, as soon as you took us to the Dominic, Dominican Republic, it's like, Man, we felt alive and we could serve and played with the kids. I'm like, well, what about that baseball game or this trip to L.A. or this water park? And I'm like, yeah, it was fun, but we just rather sacrificed all that and gone, you know, right. to the mission field. So I can remember asking my children, what was your favorite Christmas? And thinking, or what was your favorite Christmas gift? Or what, what's, what are your memories? I mean, now that you're adults and we worked so hard <laughs> to, for all of those uh, different uh different holidays and and both of my kids would say it was serving yeah it was you know mm. leaving in the morning on christmas morning and going to the carriage house and 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 serving yes. a meal that's what they remember yes so for you know for new parents who are bringing their children up it's that serving piece that that makes a huge difference and and to follow up with that it does get tricky and, and you know well, all of us with young adult children you know, you you do kind of spiritually micromanage sometimes where you're going in life and what are you doing? Are you going to Wednesday night Bible study? Are you doing leading a Sunday school? This is what I did. Well, everybody's journey is a little different it than is. yours. And I've had to learn the hard way to sit back and just cheer on the advances and strides they make in their faith walk and, and their journey with Christ and to not compare. I, my youth pastor, when I was a kid, he said, when you point people to Jesus, show them the way, point them to the way, and then for heaven's sake, get out of the way. So let God do with them, you know, what God will do with them. Well, John 1, 9 says, uh, God in Christ lights the heart of every man and draws him. Um, John 6, 44 talks about that too. So 
there's this spark he puts in every single one of us and he draws us to himself. And we have the opportunity by grace through faith to confess, repent uh, by faith, um, trust in God for his forgiveness. Curtis, could you read Colossians 1.14 about that forgiveness? He justifies us. He makes us as if we've never sinned as far as in his eyes in our position with him. He reconciles us with him. Uh, he regenerates us. He sanctifies us. He uses us for ministry. And uh, it's just an amazing process, but it is a relationship. So therefore it is unique to each one of us. But I think Colossians 3, uh, 1, 14, um summarizes this. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's all comes in Christ. And the whole purpose of that then is to go be a forgiver. Uh, forgiveness is the hallmark of, of Christianity. And it's just, uh, it's an amazing thing that the perfect God of the universe in Christ gives us that forgiveness free and allows us to go be a forgiver with others. So our prayer for you is that if you haven't, that you find salvation in Christ, that you get that you've fallen short of his perfect holiness. And that you would just really pray a simple two-sentence prayer. I can't, you can. I can't is repentance. You can is faith. I can't free myself from the penalty of sin. God in Christ, you can. I can't free myself from the power of sin. God in Christ, you can. And one day on the other side, he will free you from the presence of sin. If today's the date that you drew a line in the sand, put a stake in the ground, and fully surrendered your life to Christ as Savior and Lord, I invite you to go tell somebody. Because I can promise you this. When it's your day to go to the other side, someone's going to come to your spouse or to your children or to one of your relatives or friends and say, do you know if there was ever a date where they surrender their lives to Christ as Savior and Lord, because that's going to be the most important thing that's discussed at your funeral. And get ahead of it. Surrender now. Let God change your life now and make you new now and experience those benefits. Pass it on to the next generation and watch as your kids grow in their faith and maybe your grandchildren grow in their faith. God will use your family to make you new and everybody will have that peace and that hope that they will see you again when you're on the other side. I absolutely love this book from Mitch. Street Smarts from Proverbs is so good because Mitch has such an, an unbelievable way of taking the Bible and relating it to how we live everyday lives here in the 21st century. It's so down to earth and so practical I think you're really going to love what Mitch has to say to you.